Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in. This is episode number 86, and in this episode we are continuing on in the reading of Hosting His Presence, and uh, this will be part two of chapter 10, and uh, we'll just jump right into it. The woman now has the choice to be honest about her situation before him or hide them and continue to scurry along the fringe. If we cannot be honest with Jesus, who knows all our failures anyway, then we deny ourselves the breakthrough that his presence offers us. The biggest barrier to our freedom, deliverance, and breakthrough is self. Jesus said, deny yourself, carry your cross, and follow me. Matthew 16, 24. Why was the first command to deny self? Self is the biggest barrier. I am hard-pressed to find a problem in life that, at its core, is not an issue of self. This woman gave Jesus an honest account, saying, I have no husband. With that, Jesus ripped off the bandage and says, You are right in saying you have no husband. You have had five husbands, and the one you are living with is not your husband. She was able to fully admit her circumstances. Jesus has now gotten her attention by effectively saying, I know you. She quickly asserted that Jesus must be a prophet. He was about to speak something to her that would bring her alive. Because the relationship between Jews and Samaritans was so hostile, Samaritans had to establish their own place of worship on Mount Gerizim instead of in Jerusalem, like the Jews. Jesus removed every obstacle to worshiping the Father. Place, race, or sex serve as no barrier to true worship of God. God seeks true worship, which is to worship in spirit and in truth. Jesus ends the encounter with this woman by saying, I am the Messiah. If we can be honest during the encounter of presence, we can get insight into our true selves and into the person of Jesus. We can see him rightly and in turn see ourselves as he sees us, beloved In the light of that reality, no inferior perspective can stand. This woman was so greatly impacted, she could not keep it to herself. Discarding her concern for popular opinion, she tells the people of her town, Come, see a man who told me everything I did. Could this be the Messiah? They came and sought this man called Jesus. The weight of her encounter was so impactful that she went from being a woman of questionable reputation to being the first evangelist of that region, recruiting others to have their own personal encounter. She became an evangelist in one encounter with Jesus. How many of us have misplaced passion and excitement for lesser things? We can get excited about our favorite sports team, stock portfolio, or job performance, but we lack passion for the only one who offers abundant life. God has created each one of us with the unique capacity to be a contagion for the kingdom of God in the world around us. Any of us can be like this woman at the well telling everyone to come and see the man who is the Messiah. The weight of her encounter made an undeniable impact in this woman's life. One recent day, the father began to teach me regarding weight. Some months back, 
I pulled into a gas station to fill my car with gas. I noticed a sticker on the pump saying weights and measures. I began to ponder on this phrase. The Department of Agriculture ensures the weights and measures of things are accurately represented to the public. The Lord asked me, how do I measure things? This was the beginning of a string of thoughts regarding this topic. Our Heavenly Father does not measure and weigh like we do. As humanity, we tend to measure based on numerical significance. When Ezekiel was led further into the river, every 1,000 cubits, the river got deeper. The further out he went, the deeper the water became. The further you walk with the Spirit of God, the deeper and more consuming His Spirit to you. The Ark of Noah, the Temple, the New Jerusalem, and the Ark of the Covenant all involve measurements, but all carry an element of covenant, presence, fellowship, and promise. The weight of His glory incorporates each element. When we shed our preconceptions of how He weighs and measures, we can see and value like our Father. This interaction with the Lord reminded me that in the Bible, the value of money was determined by weight. In the United States, we have money that is assigned a face value. A $100 bill has worth that is indicated on the face, on the surface of the bill. As a society, we have embraced face value rather than substance or weight. North American Christianity often has been reduced to a surface deep experience or face value. What we fail to offer individuals is the weight of his encounter. When I say weight, I mean the tangible, experiential, heavy, and glorious presence of God that goes so deep in our hearts that we do not just behave better, we are transformed from the inside out. The weight of an encounter with Jesus is one that carries significance, not by man's standard of measure, but by God's standard. In a crowd of thousands, one person who is radically changed in their heart from whom they were once is a significant encounter. Man would say this is not significant numerically. There is no greater miracle than a life and heart transformed. The church needs encounters a mile deep and an inch wide. We need to adopt God's standard of weights and measures and shed our carnal one. The enemy of great is big. Let us stop seeing impact measured through numbers. Let us stop weighing significance based on reach, social media, and our platform. Let us be content with obscurity and working behind the scenes. Let us do nothing we do not see the Father doing and say nothing we do not hear the Father saying. Let us stop competing for composition and influence. Many people fail at this because it requires intimacy. Intimacy requires relationship and relationship requires devotion. Divided devotion is a plague among God's people. Jesus made it crystal clear when he said you cannot serve both God and materialism. Matthew 6, 24. Divided devotion is what the Father is looking to eradicate in our hearts. Divided devotion is the enemy to intimacy. When the bride and bridegroom consummate their wedding, no outside devotion is permitted in that bedchamber. Why then 
do we allow divided devotion in our relationship with Father God through the Son, Jesus? The heart that is not fully surrendered is the heart with divided devotion. Is Jesus what you desire? Are encounters with Him what you hope for and cling to? Do you hunger for growth in knowledge and holiness as our Lord lived and desires for us to live? Do you search for moments to encounter His presence and hear Him speak to your heart and mind? These are all indicators of a heart devoted to intimacy. As he points out those areas of your heart that remain undevoted to him, let the magnitude of his presence become Lord over all areas of your life and experience freedom in sonship of our Father God through Jesus Christ. Many of the Samaritans in that town put their belief in Jesus because of the woman's testimony. They requested Jesus to stay with them longer, and he did so for two days. They said to the woman, We no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we now know that this man really is the Savior of the world. John 4, 42. The people had taken her word and went out to see Jesus. But they experienced for themselves the reality of who he is. How many times do we fail to reach into him and experience him for ourselves? We take the testimony of a preacher, parent, or friend, but we fail to experience him personally. As a result, we fail to grasp the precious promises we have with abiding in him. If we can experience Jesus personally, we can put to death any doubt we may have about the validity of what faith through Jesus can accomplish in our hearts and minds. We must shift from only hearing to knowing, from watching to experiencing, and from professing to demonstrating. The presence of God stirs your faith. In John 5, we find the story of the lame man at the pool in Bethesda. This pool of water was surrounded by five covered porches where a great number of disabled people would lie. The blind, the lame, the paralyzed. The disabled would wait for the moving of the waters by an angel of the Lord. The first one into the pool after each stirring would be cured of their affliction. One man in this story had been an invalid for 38 years, but he could not make it into the pool before someone else got in. I believe this story is showing us the power of stirred faith. The pool was surrounded by five covered porches, The first five books of the Old Testament are called the Torah, the law. I suggest the parallel that a great number of people were resting on religion and legalism, waiting to be healed and made whole. These stirred waters would generate healing for one individual, and so they each guarded their own interests. This man who had been disabled for 38 years represents helplessness and inability. In Deuteronomy 2.14, 38 years passed until all the fighting men had died as God promised before the Lord moved his people into the promise. What had kept them out unbelief. What do these fighting men represent? Striving. God had disabled their ability to strive. God forced them into reliance upon him. At this pool, disabled and dysfunctional people 
were gathered, and Jesus came face to face with a man who had no ability to strive when these waters were stirred. As I began to seek understanding in this miracle, I re realized this type of miracle does not seem consistent with how God's kingdom typically functions. Does God usually choose the fastest or most able-bodied person to accomplish his will? He typically goes after the least likely person to demonstrate his mighty arm. I believe this healing miracle was given to these people to demonstrate the power of faith. Once these waters were stirred, so was their faith stirred to receive breakthrough for the healing they so desperately needed. This lame man had no one to place him in the waters, so rather than try, he sat back as an observer of other people's breakthrough. This is what lifeless religion does to you. It has you doing things that produce no real life. Jesus called this concept whitewashed tombs with beautiful exteriors, but only death inside. I would go one step further and suggest that I believe more than one healing may have been available. I believe that only one person received healing because after one received their breakthrough, the faith of everyone else plummeted. I believe this true story tells us to stop relying on legalism and religion. Step out of dysfunction. Stop striving to meet our own needs and realize the power that faith possesses. In John chapter 6, we read about Jesus feeding the 5,000 men. The presence of God will satisfy and overflow your heart. Jesus looked out and saw the multitude of people and asked Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He was testing Philip because Jesus already knew what he was going to do. Whenever Jesus asks you a question, be sure that he already knows the plan, but he seeks to have you identify the watermark of your faith. With only five loaves and two fish, the need was great, but the supply was very little. Little is much when God is in it. Jesus told his disciples to have the people sit. Jesus gave thanks to God for the loaves and fish and distributed to the crowd as much as they each wanted. When they all had enough to eat, they gathered the leftovers, filling 12 large baskets. With our own resources, we fall short and cannot meet the need. With the limitless resources of heaven through Jesus, nothing is beyond our grasp to fulfill that which God has sent us to accomplish. Philip did not answer the question Jesus posed to him. Where would we buy bread for all these people to eat? Philip rather focused his response not on the solution, but rather the impossibility of the situation. When Jesus puts you in situations where your dependency in his supernatural provision is required, be sure you celebrate the opportunity to display his mighty arm. Note that Jesus required the people to be seated. Seated is the posture of rest. He takes away their ability to strive and earn the food. He provides this bread himself, disconnected from striving. One must only be seated to receive sustenance. When Jesus is present, he not only gives you enough to satisfy your desire, but he gives in excess and the overflow is never wasted. When his presence is available, he will satisfy your desire and become an overflow of provision to your heart and those around you. Be that overflow. And that concludes chapter 10 of Hosting His Presence. And the next episode will be the conclusion of this reading um, with the concluding remarks. So I want to thank you for taking the time. I pray this is a blessing. 
and we will see you on the next one. If it means that I'm close to you, I would trade a million lifetimes for